cornerstone of plate tectonics is that new plate, new lithosphere, is created beneath the oceans and gives rise to the phenomenon of seafloor spreading. So how is oceanic lithosphere made? So on this map of the age of the seabed, we can see that the youngest seafloor is concentrated along the mid-ocean ridges. This is where at least the crust is formed. So we can cartoon this up in this idealised block diagram and infer that the crust is formed at the ridge crest. Consequently, as more crust is formed at the ridge, the earlier formed crust is moved away. The impact of different spreading rates is seen in the map, so that the Atlantic only has a thin strip of young crust, so it's a slow spreading area, compared to the East Pacific, where the young crust extends for a much greater distance. But what about the lithospheric mantle? We can see that it's thin in our cartoon below the ridge crest, but thickens as you move away from the ridge crest. This suggests that at least some of the mantle is added to the lithosphere later, after the plate has moved off the ridge. So in answering the question, how is new plate formed? It's useful to break this into two issues, the formation of the crust, and then the evolution of the mantle lithosphere. So let's start off with the crust. So this crust must form somehow from the mantle that underlies the ridges. This involves melting and that melt migrating to the surface where it freezes to become the basaltic crust. So let's explore this process. And we can do this by plotting temperature against pressure. Now, because pressure increases with depth in the Earth in a predictable way, we can convert pressure to depth. So you can refer to either side of this diagram. So let's imagine a piece of mantle down there at about 80 kilometers. And we're going to melt it through decompression. And it's tempting to think that this decompression will be isothermal. But actually it isn't. As materials decompress, they become cooler. You're probably familiar with this type of process. If you try and pump up a bicycle tyre, the pump becomes hot as you compress the air. Well here we're doing the opposite, we're decompressing, so the mantle, the rock, will cool while retaining the same energy. So the path taken by our mantle as it rises in pressure temperature space is something like this. It's a constant energy path. We're saying that this decompression is adiabatic and this type of path, which is constant energy, is called an adiabat. As we develop this story, we're going to talk about mantle temperature and variations in it. And when comparing temperatures, it's useful to talk about what the temperature of a particular piece of mantle would be were it at the Earth's surface having risen up one of these adiabats. And this is called the mantle potential temperature. So in this particular case, our rock would end up at the Earth's surface with a temperature of 1280 degrees. So that is the potential temperature of our imaginary sample. OK, so let's imagine our rock is moving up this adiabat and somewhere along the line, it's going to melt. Let's say it starts melting here. Will it continue to follow the same path as if it hadn't melted? Well, the answer is no. Melting takes energy and this will enhance the cooling effect. Again, there's a household example of this. If you decompress liquid camping fuel to make camping gas, the gas cylinder cools down, reflecting the energy it takes to change state. If our rock continues its journey, it will end here. So melting is a chemical reaction, so we can draw a line where this reaction occurs in pressure temperature space. Here we go. It's called the solidus. This is the start of melting. So mantle is a collection of chemical compounds. We call those minerals. 
So melting is not an all or nothing affair. Although this rock might start melting as it crosses the solidus, a particular composition will only become completely molten when it crosses something called the liquidus, and this plots way out here. So melting is a reaction that occupies a range of positions in pressure temperature space, and we can contour up the space between solidus and liquidus to reveal the proportion of mantle that becomes melt as it passes through this domain. So were our rock to follow its adiabat from 100% solid all the way up to the Earth's surface, it would have generated 24.5% melt volume. The remainder, 75.5%, would remain as solid mantle. We can now compare a series of trajectories taken by mantle with distinct potential temperatures. So here are some other adiabats. Let's just consider the other one we've highlighted here, which has a potential temperature of 1580. So that at any particular depth in the Earth, mantle following this trajectory will be hotter than the sample we first considered. And if some mantle follows this adiabat to its conclusion and reaches the surface, then it will have generated something like 38% melt, so a significantly greater melt fraction. So melt percentage is a function not only of the decompression, but also the mantle potential temperature. Let's illustrate this in a few cartoons. So here in purple we have mantle, so the left-hand column shows unmelted mantle. In the first example, following an adiabat with a potential temperature of 1280, we generate a small melt fraction, leaving a large part of residual mantle. Contrast that with the other adiabat, and we'll generate a significantly greater melt fraction and a correspondingly smaller amount of residual mantle. So that melt becomes oceanic crust. So on the 1280 path, we generate a relatively small amount of melt, a small thickness of crust, compared to the 1580 trajectory. We can explore this further. So this graph shows melt thickness, in other words, crustal thickness that will be generated by this process, versus potential temperature. And the relationships plot like this. So we can plot on our 1280 material. Here we go. And this generates normal oceanic crust with a thickness of six or seven kilometers. What about our 1580 mantle? So this will plot on the graph somewhere right up here with a melt thickness of 30 kilometers or more. And this might be more representative of abnormal oceanic crust, such as is found under Iceland. So hotter mantle, in other words, with a higher potential temperature, will generate more melt and consequently thicker oceanic crust. And we can see this on the bathymetric map of the oceans. So by and large, the mid-Atlantic ridge is below sea level and presumably is underlain by normal oceanic crust. In contrast, Iceland, we infer, has got thick oceanic crust beneath it and consequently it pokes out of the water. OK, so that's oceanic crust. What about the mantle? Well, a key feature of the oceans is that the bathymetry varies off the mid-ocean ridges. Fairly obviously, otherwise they wouldn't be ridges. And this, we can pick this out if we look further afield. So we can see the mid-Atlantic ridge and the East Pacific rise. These have rather different form. The seabed drops away from the ridge in both cases, but it's not a constant relationship with distance. So what does the bathymetry relate to if it's not simply distance from the ridge? By the middle to late 1970s, there was enough data around to begin to compile 
the age of the ocean crust and to begin to compare that with the water depth at which it was found. In other words, its bathymetry. So let's see how these early dates are plotted. Here's the data for the Pacific and the Indian Ocean and finally the Atlantic. And all these data sit rather nicely on a single curve. So this illustrates that bathymetry relates to the age of the plate, or at least the oceanic crust. We can illustrate this with a much more modern compilation of data from around the world. Let's compare these three areas, either side of the Atlantic and one in the Pacific. All of these have about the same bathymetry with these dark blue colours, which represent water depths of about five kilometres. If we mix on the age of the seabed, these three areas all have these green colours, which equates to about 100 million years, plus or minus about 20. So it takes about 80 to 100 million years to generate these mature water depths. So let's think a little bit about how this might work. Let's imagine this is the situation and a profile of some oceanic lithosphere very close to a mid-ocean ridge. It's got its crust and it's got some lithospheric mantle below. So we have new plate with its moho and the base of the plate and beneath that a seamosphere. Now let's add some more mantle from the asthenosphere into the lithosphere. Consequently, the base of the plate drops. Let's imagine this represents older plate. Now let's think about the average density of these two situations. We've added mantle to the lithosphere as the plate has become older. Mantle is denser than crust, therefore the average density of the older plate has been increased relative to the situation for the new plate. If we increase its density, that plate will subside. And that's charted by the increase in water depth. So this rather elegantly explains the relationship between bathymetry and age. It tells us that the addition of mantle to the lithosphere takes tens of millions of years. The distinction between the seamosphere and lithosphere for mantle is simply its rigidity. And that relates to temperature. Stiff, cool, upper mantle is lithosphere. So the graph tells us about how long it takes for the upper mantle to cool, having been uplifted beneath the ridges. So for the slow spreading mid-Atlantic, you don't have to go very far off the ridge to find crust that has spent a long time away from that ridge. Consequently, the underlying upper mantle has had a long time to cool, generating subsidence reflected by the greater water depth. In contrast, the East Pacific rise is a fast spreading ridge system. So the oceanic crust moves a long way off the ridge in a relatively short time, as does its underlying mantle. Therefore, this substance process happens further away from the ridge for fast-spreading systems. So here we are, we've just dealt with some really classic concepts in plate tectonics, exploring the way in which oceanic lithosphere is formed. We've seen that the crust is formed by decompression, partial melting of the upper mantle. The amount of crust we get depends not only on the amount of decompression, but also on the potential temperature of that mantle. The mantle component of the oceanic lithosphere evolves off the ridge as the upper mantle cools, changing its mechanical behaviour so that what was once a seamosphere becomes lithosphere. This thermal reequilibration takes over a hundred million years.
so the recovery of thermal anomalies in the outer part of the Earth takes a long time. And the action of these two processes working together explains the variations in bathymetry across the world's ocean basins.